There's probably not another author on the planet right now as famous as Canadian Margaret Atwood. Her new book is one of the most eagerly awaited literary events of the past 40 years. The Testaments is the follow-up to Atwood's most successful book, The Handmaid's Tale. It's the story of a brutal regime in the Republic of Gilead. For six decades, Margaret Atwood has dazzled readers with her mastery of every genre, fiction, non-fiction, poetry, short stories, children's books. From her very first work, a poetry collection, she has won award after award, notably the 2000 Booker Prize for The Blind Assassin. Her most famous novel, The Handmaid's Tale, published in 1985, was recently turned into a TV series in which Atwood had a cameo. It's about an imagined future where the United States is a dystopian theocracy. The book's themes of the misuse of power and the oppression of women have made it a timeless classic of the same status as George Orwell's 1984. Now, 35 years on, Atwood has produced a sequel and The Testaments was immediately shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. Margaret Atwood, congratulations on your new book, The Testaments, and in particular its Booker Prize nomination. Thank you. In another of your books, Negotiating with the Dead, you write, a book may outlive its author and it moves too, and it too can be said to change, but not in the manner of the telling, it changes in the manner of the reading. Since The Handmaid's Tale was published in 1985, how do you think it has evolved in the way people read it? I think it's evolved in relation to um, events that have come about. So in 1985, jury was out as to whether the United States would ever move in the direction of a totalitarian theocracy. Uh, and I think people are feeling somewhat more nervous about that now. Whereas in the 90s, The Handmaid's Tale seemed to be receding into the far distant past. Now it seems to be coming closer and closer. And that accounts in part for the uh, way in which the television series is being viewed and the way in which the book is being read, not as a fantasy but as a possibility. These books are often referred to as feminist, but is it more precise to say that they are about the way power is sought, taken and used by both men and women? Oh, I, I think that's that's entirely fair. The, the um, power distribution has been um, predominantly male since the Bronze Age. It wasn't before. <laughs> and that, that's a long story, the relationship between agriculture, weapons, wars, and upper body strength. Uh, there have been um, other arrangements of society at other times and in other places. Um, so, I, so I am interested in, in who gets to say, you know, who, who gets to make the laws who doesn't get to make the laws. So it's, it's not a given that women will work in the interests of, of women. Um, and so it is in, in Gilead, but any, any group um, oppressing, imperializing, ruling over another group usually um, raises uh, an army of controllers or a group of controllers from within that group why it's cheaper, easier, and it works better. The Testaments explores how the character of Aunt Lydia becomes one of the top female power brokers in Gilead. How long have you had the idea of taking her character further? I started thinking about the book probably in about 2015, and that's, that stage is always, am I going to do this, am I not going to do this? And I note that I... Um, wrote a note to my publishers in February of 2017 saying, this is the book. And why did God allow such a terrible thing to happen? Teach her a lesson. The performance of Anne Dowd really, really enriched the concept of that character. Anne Dowd in the series made her much more well-rounded character, but, but, but at that point we didn't have her backstory. We didn't know how she got there. So in the Testaments, I was interested in a couple things, how she got that way, and also how regimes crumble, how regimes like that fall apart. 
Last November, you said on Twitter of the Testaments that it was inspired by everything readers had ever asked you about Gilead and its inner workings. What are the things that readers have most asked you over the years? What they wanted most to know was what happens to Wofford. And uh, that was the book I, I couldn't write because I could not recreate that voice. So I didn't want to attempt that because I, I knew it would fail. But then there was another way of coming at the story, and that was through other narrators. And, and I would, since I was interested in how those kinds of regimes fall apart, it would have to be in the middle to late Gilead period. So I said it uh, 15 to 16 years later than the end of The Handmaid's Tale. You turn 80 in November. When you survey the landscape of your life from here, does it feel like, looking back, that it had a plot? Or does a lifetime feel like a series of random and chance events just strung into a line? Both. <laughs> when you look back at anything, you always see a plot. <laughs> because that's what happened. So you said, OK, this is the plot. This is the trajectory. But when you look at the intersections of certain events, you think, well, that was luck. How does it feel to know that you are definitely going to be significant beyond your lifetime, that people will study your papers, that they will continue reading your books and discussing them long after you die? Uh, how does that feel? Well, I intend to be around, just hovering over their shoulders, soaking it all up. Am, am, I, am I going to haunt my own archives? I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote that you've highlighted previously, which is that wanting to meet an author because you like their work is like wanting to meet a duck because you like pâté. That is true, but nonetheless, as a long-time lover of the pâté, it has been a great privilege to get to talk to the duck, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. That's the program for tonight. Foreign Correspondents up next. Thanks for your company. Good night.